And now for our scripture reading, you may be seated. In unison. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, <clears throat> just as this potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intend to bring on it. And at another moment, I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I had, had intended to do to it. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, Look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. God's holy word. I don't see any little ones, but we're going to all be kids at heart, or we are all kids at heart. So, and I told my Self, this is sometimes you're like this is the adults need to hear this too. So, uh, this was the uh, creation of an artist from the last congregation I served. At the beginning of Lent, I brought in some clay pots and I put them in pillowcases and then I hit them with a hammer and broke them and everybody could hear the pop, you know. It was fun. The kids, ha oh, right? And then I, one of the pots was given to the Sunday school. I took one home, and then one of the, this church had a lot of artists, took this home, and Brenda was a good support. And then at the end of Lent, she brought this back, and we all displayed our, our, what we had created from the brokenness. And she had gone through, they had a rummage sale and had walked through and she found this little church that says, restore, he restores my soul. And I think she found these little sheep too. And um, this little cross was given to me by a, a, by a family uh, from, from the church and their little girls made, made me these crosses to hang on my, hang on my tree. So uh, I have had this, I brought this home for, because it was just so pretty and I brought it here this morning, and I'm not moving it ever again. <laughs> Off this table, yes, but it, it, is qu it is quite fragile. In fact, this little guy took a nosedive, so he's, got, he's now got a little scar on his face uh, because he broke open. But I was able to put it back with some, some glue. The scripture passage that we just read talked about God being the great potter. And you know, when something goes wrong, that God can make something out of it. This is, this is resurrection. This is death of a dream. This is you know, all different things. I, our brokenness, God can create something beautiful and incredible and that we didn't anticipate. And I thought this when I woke up this morning, and yesterday we found out that, and there's lots of mesh folks here, that MESH is doing something different. The organization has decided that they're only going to distribute food from one location, and it is not Grace Presbyterian Church. And so the, and it is going to be a grab-and-go experience versus sitting down and, 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 and having a meal together. So it's a little bit of heartbreak, 
with that. But I trust that God will take our passion, your passion, to serve others and to feed people in practical ways. Somehow God is going to make that doable because God can take our brokenness and refashion it into something absolutely gorgeous and beautiful again and again and again. Let's say a prayer together. Gracious God, for all the ways that um, you refashion us, we're grateful. We do mourn endings, but we rest, or we're telling ourselves, Lord, to rest in the peace and the faith that rebirth is to come. We pray this in Jesus' name, and we pray for whatever that situation is that those trucks are running to, Lord. We pray for preservation of life, peace of mind, body, mind, and soul for all who are involved. In Jesus' name, amen. And our second gospel lesson comes from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and, he, and Jesus turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today is a day of speaking truths. One of the things that used to haunt me as a kid, I would, would in church and I would get sent to Christian camps and Christian conferences, is when they would quote Revelation 3, verse 16. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus does not like lukewarm Christians. God will spit us out of God's mouth. We were to be on fire. And truth is, I wanted to be on fire. Today we might say all in. But I also wanted to be accepted and get invited to parties and not be the wet blanket at the parties. And also truth, my holier-than-thou shtick was pretty pathetic. I could only be good for so long. And then there's that moment of weakness where, let me tell you what I really think about so-and-so. <clears throat> and I'm not sure things change that much for adults. The desire to fit in and be accepted, even Christians, who will say that we seek to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That sounds like being all in. But what does it look like? Jesus has just painted a picture. Jesus has a large crowd gathered, and his PR guy is really excited, right? This is going to be great for business. You are really popular, Jesus. Let him have it. And then Jesus does, but not in the way expected. 
If you want to be my, my disciple, you have to be willing to leave your family and friends behind. You have to be willing to die. You have to be willing to give away all your possessions. Still want to follow me? And the PR guy quit on the spot. Barbara Brown Taylor begins her sermon on this passage. You used to think you were a disciple until you read this. We talk about being disciples. We may talk about discipleship. When I talk to colleagues, I have yet to find anybody who can define that clearly for me. But if you read this passage, very few of us are disciples. Barbara Brown Taylor would say, we're more like friends of disciples. Mother Teresa is a disciple, was the disciple. Bonhoeffer, Dorothy Day, Oscar Romero, Sojourner Truth, Francis of Assisi. Most of us are admirers of the commitments of these true disciples. I saw an interview with evangelist Tony Campolo, who you may have heard of. He was a part of my, my childhood. He even came to my church one time. Tremendous evangelist. He taught in Philadelphia, I think at Eastern. Taught sociology, but he was known for his, his going to Christian conferences and, and, in, and seeking to inspire faith. But he shared about, and he did a, a series on stewardship and money. And he said, you know, as a middle-class American, I think we need to own the fact that, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable. There are folks who, if we are called to austerity, there are folks who have sacrificed a lot more. We are making choices, and I think, you know, I need to recognize, or we need to recognize, that we're willing to go here. And if Jesus, you know, if the all-in folks are here, I appreciated his honesty. And in our stewardship series last year, I talked about, and this was a, a series developed by Adam Hamilton, a Methodist pastor, talked about seeking to live simply so that we don't enslave ourselves to things. Like, you know, if you have a huge mortgage, you know, right? So to seek living simply. But I, there's the money aspect of this passage, but I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too far. So let's just you know, talk about, are we willing to hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters? Every commentator that I read said, this is prophetic hyperbole. He's just saying that to get everyone's attention. In other places, we're told not to hate and to, to love the people who you know, lo love our enemies. It boils down to this, are we willing to put Jesus first? Forsaking all others until death do us part. Yes. Yeah. Sure. But I don't think Jesus is really going to ask us to make those kind of sacrifices. But if push comes to shove, if I were sure that that's what Jesus wanted, I'd be willing to sacrifice anything. If I were sure that that's what Jesus wanted. I'd be willing. Is that true? I remember sitting at a conference with, it was a pastor's retreat, and the passage of Abraham sacrificing Isaac came up, and I heard one of my colleagues down the row said, nope, no way. And I thought, that's honest. In my research on this passage, I was led to read in Exodus, where Moses asked the Levites to go down to the gate and kill brothers and sisters, those who are sinning, to show their loyalty to God. And I remember a friend who said, who was not raised in the church, but who took the time as an adult to sit and read the Bible from cover to cover, and he said, Robin, too much violence. And I said, yeah, you know, I don't know what I said, but yeah, I mean, the Ten, the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not kill, and it is immediately ignored. I but Jesus does say, blessed are the peacemakers. But then he just referenced a king going to war in the passage that we just read. Yeah, the, the Bible can be a tough read. And faith is what makes someone sit and wrestle with these passages until they bless us. What is the blessing here? Jesus, what are you asking of us? 
there are three interpretations of this passage that I encountered in my research. One is that discipleship is the calling of just the few. Two is we're not called to give up our families or our possessions. What we're called to is not to be overly attached. The attachment is the issue. And number three, we recognize that the, that the discipleship is the calling of the few, and so we support those disciples. And in instances, we are, actually are those disciples when we make those sacrifices. And in the meantime, we lift up and we tell the stories of discipleship with awe and admiration. Let's sit with the statement in the instances when we, we know that we're called to sacrifice. We, we strive. We strive to be willing to do it. Sacrifice usually means discomfort. It usually means pain. How much do we try to avoid pain? How much do you try to avoid pain? How much do I try to avoid pain? Make it stop is usually our mantra. And that's, I think that's human nature. But pain or discomfort is a precursor to something new being created, to something new being born. Lessons from childbirth. Giving birth is painful. So we figured out ways to make it less painful. My mother was anesthetized. I love that word, anesthetized. You know, blah, blah, blah. Anesthetized. I, you know, I, I didn't ask too many questions about it. Maybe some of you, you know, she woke up to a baby. I don't know how that works. I opted for epidurals. I, I went in hoping to have natural childbirth. And then, and they're like, would you like an epidural? Yeah, okay. I admire greatly the women who did it without pain meds. And it's a, it's a club I wish that I was a part of because I think learning to endure suffering is a life skill. In parenting, we have to endure seeing our children suffer. Or we can harm them in the long run because learning to recover from defeat and failure is a life skill. As a culture, we need to be reminded that change does not happen without upheaval. And I keep telling myself that the ugliness of this time is necessary to create a more just world. But there is discomfort and, and maybe a collective longing for simpler times except that it wasn't simple for everybody, and so turmoil until something new is born. I believe that the Holy Spirit is doing something in our churches, making it necessary for churches to reconnect with their communities, to get outdoors, and start creating relationships with people outside of the buildings. This is a great thing, but an incredibly uncomfortable thing it will require sacrifice, and the question is, are we willing? If it is true that only the exceptional person is willing to lay it all out there, then it doesn't bode well. But I woke this morning with uh, unease, thinking, is this, is this the message for this morning? And I realized I'm the, this was the lectionary passage for the week, and I don't know that I've ever preached on this, but I, I appreciate pastors. Barbara Brown Taylor is a master of this, taking the really difficult texts and wrestling with it. That is what I, I admire and seek to do. And I'm like, so it's the, but is that after last week, Donald's last week, after, and finding out about Mesh yesterday, and just going, ugh. What is the word of hope, Lord, for this morning? And it's Jeremiah. If it does all fall apart, then the great potter will be there to help put it all back together. Can these bones live? Yes. Is resurrection po possible? Yes, but only after death. 
Will the sacrifice sometimes be forced on us whether we like it or not? Yes. But God is a builder who took, in, took into account what God had to work with before God started. God will build and rebuild God's kingdom with disciples and friends of disciples, you and me. But let us be clear as well as honest. Being a follower of Jesus involves sacrifice, eschewing personal comfort, living sacrificially so that others might live, we live in the tension of you know, celebrating that the bar for our dis- discipleship is high, but recognizing that we have learned to limbo under, underneath it. So our prayer might be that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven in us and through us and despite us. May we ever be mindful of how God of when and how God is asking us to sacrifice of ourselves. And may we have courage and faith and zeal to follow where God leads, no matter the cost. Because new life, new creation, birth and rebirth do not happen without first going through labor, which is another way of saying taking up one's cross. And when I, wrote that, when I wrote that last line of going through labor, I'm like, oh, and it's Labor Day. Totally. So happy Labor Day tomorrow. Totally different meaning and understanding. Uh, taking rest from work in order to be renewed and restored. That's part of the journey, too. But may our Sabbaths create in us the well to follow where God leads no matter what, in Jesus' name, amen.